Morning. Good to see you again, even though uh, I'm seeing you through the internet. Um, we're glad you decided to come hang out with us this morning. Um, you know, I say things a lot around here. One of the things that we say is, when was the last time you've done something for the first time? So last Sunday, this is the first time I'd ever preached to an empty room, uh, except for Miss Nancy. And by the way, she didn't get saved last week, but I still have hope that it'll happen this week. And uh, this morning, I was reminded of, you know, that story of uh, the guy that got up on Sunday morning. And he said, uh, his wife said, I don't want to go to church. I'm just, I just, I don't think I want to go. Well, why do you not want to go? I just, I don't like them and they don't like me. Well, this morning you don't have to come to church. But you know who that guy was? The wife went over and said, you got to go to church. You're the pastor. <laughs> I thought it was kind of funny. But um, we're glad you're here. We're going to worship a little bit. We're going to share God's word. I hope you get uh, encouraged this morning as we just want to delve in and chase him. You see, we say this a lot around here at the gathering. Uh, he wants to be chased after. He wants to be found by us. And in times like this, I'm telling you, our Savior is just a, a simple prayer away from meeting our very need. And so I encourage you with these words found in the Psalms as we begin to worship. David said this in Psalm 100. He said, Shout joyfully unto the Lord all the earth. Let's serve our Lord with gladness. Let's come before him with a joyful song, knowing that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has met us, amen, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and we are the sheep of his pasture. So let's enter his gates with thanksgiving, and then to his courts with praise, giving thanks to him to bless his name. For the Lord is good. Hallelujah. Amen. Is his loving kindness this everlasting, and it is his faithfulness to us and to all generations. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning, and we just declare our dependence on you. We need you desperately. Probably in most times, desperately, more desperately than ever before. We need to hear you. We need to sense you and feel you. And so, God, this morning, just draw, you said, I'll draw nigh to you if you'll draw nigh to me. So we're going to draw close to you, and we need you to just draw close to us. There's many that's going to be watching this morning that need to hear these words from you. I love you. I'm your God. I'm going to take care of you. I got exactly what you need. So would you allow us to be encouraged this morning as we worship? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
God's given us not a spirit of timidity, but of power and of a sound mind. You see, Timothy even told us that we need to, to transform our mind by the renewing of that through God's Word. So my hope this morning is that we can be encouraged in our faith, that we can maybe change our paradigm of how we see the world in which we are currently living. And may we get our perspective from you and you alone, the maker of heaven and earth. So God, for those of us who may be just tuning in or at the end of the rope or just can't handle it anymore, don't understand or confuse, I pray very simply that your word goes forth in the power that you want it to and accomplish everything you want it to accomplish in the lives of the people who are hearing the words that you're going to speak, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Well, you know, I wish you were here. Uh, I wish I could see you face to face. I miss you. Uh, we haven't hugged. We're doing the social distancing, you know. We, you know, you know me, I'm a hugger. I like to hug and so we, uh, you know, we're just kind of waving at each other and, uh, you know, the gang. So there's three or four of us here and we're going, I'm going to make them all sit at a different table to make sure they're, they're spaced out. So we're, we're, we're behaving ourselves. And I got Katie here to keep me straight because, you know, as a nurse, she's not going to let me get out of hand. But you're going to need your Bible. Let's go ahead and get it. You're going to need your notebook and you're going to need a pen. I'm going to give you all these scriptures so that as you follow me, as, as in this teaching moment, you can, you can turn to these passages. You know, if you were here, you know all the verses would be put up on the, on the big screen there. But you don't have that opportunity. So I'm going to give you these verses up front. And then uh, we'll, we'll get to them here in a minute. But I want you to turn to Philippians chapter 4. And we'll, I'll give you the verses in a minute. But Philippians chapter 4. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Mark chapter 7. I'm going to give you some, but it, I'll just make reference to them, but let me give you the ones at the end. Uh, Philippians 4, 19, Psalms 84, 11, and Matthew 6, and I'll get you to the verses because there'll be a few of those. But, you know, as we said last week, if you tuned in, and I hope you did, you know, we, we spent the whole morning talking about trust and who do we trust, and Who's in charge and, you know, who who, uh, who can I trust, what can I trust? And so I don't have time to re-preach last Sunday. But on the, 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 the heels of that, you know, service last Sunday, I felt led to, you know, I've heard so many people say, well, why don't you, you know, I get notes from you guys and I get people that send me stuff and explain why this is happening. And, you know, the Holy Spirit didn't tell me to explain that to you. And, you know, I've heard... You know, people talk about the Chronicles passage. If my people, which are called by my name, you know, shall humble themselves and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then they'll hear from heaven and I'll heal their land. I agree our, our land needs to be healed, no doubt about it. But I'm not here to try to convince you of why this is happening, how did it happen. What, what I want you to really think about this morning more than ever, ever, is how are you actually thinking? Are we thinking, and is our minds uh, so bombarded these days, as you know, with information overload, I mean, it doesn't take long for you to kind of get overwhelmed by the information that's out. 
You know, we bombarded from all sides with all kinds of good, watch this, and bad information. You know, are we trying to disseminate, you know, what's really true in this information and what's really not? We're trying to figure out, you know, who can I believe and who can I not? You know, what's really, you know, how far is it should I distance myself? And, you know, there's 10 people or 20 people meeting or, you know, I mean, we're, we're just constantly trying to figure this out. And, you know, not to mention, you know, we're, many of us are isolated within our own homes. And that will drive some people stir crazy. If you've got ADD, I can assure you, you're going crazy. You'll go to one room and go, I just was in here. You know what I mean? I'm telling you, it'll get to the point where you just drive yourself nuts because you can't stand it. You're inside your home. And then, so we're trying to find creative ways to go out. And, and if you didn't, yesterday was absolutely gorgeous. If you didn't get outside, you should have. But, you know, we're trying to find things to get, get our minds to quit thinking about all this stuff. And, and I couldn't say most of it's negative. You know, it was told to me as a young boy, and I don't know where this quote comes from, but it was said, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. I think my grandmother told me that, actually. And, uh, and, I, and I believe that's true. You know, a mind that's not staying on top of things, that's idle, is the devil's playground. He runs around and starts planning things of insecurity and uncertainty. And watch this, anxiety. You know, I'm not uh, going to sit up here and say, you know, I'm not affected. And nor are the people that I, I live with and uh, the people that are in my immediate family and the people that are in my church aren't affected by this craziness. I mean, I know people have lost their jobs and lost their incomes and, you know, lost their ability to, to make. But, you know, I understand that. And so there's anxiety there. I totally understand that. But with anxiety, there's a way we handle it biblically. You see, if we trust him, and I'm going to hit some of these verses at the very end. Believe me, my friend, if you know Christ today, if Jesus has come to live in your heart, Trust me, if I don't say anything else you understand today, trust this one thing. He says once he becomes the owner, once you've given him your heart, then he's responsible for you. He said, I'm going to take care of you. I'm never going to leave you, nor am I going to forsake you. I'm going to take care of you. And so I know in the midst of these words, hey, you know, we're going to have to let you go, there's some anxiety and fear. And then there's some, uh, some an anxious moments of wondering, how am I going to make it? What am I going to do? So you know what? This instability, this unstableness in times like this, for you and I as a Christian, how we handle it really is simply done by understanding something so simple. And it's understanding yours and my answer come from the truths that are found in this book called His Word. You see, everybody else is trying to find out and run around and find answers to all the problems. My mentor, years and years ago, who's gone to be with the Lord now, used to tell me, and he ingrained it in my brain, he said there's over 7,000 promises found in this book. Over 7,000. He said we need to spend most of our time focusing on finding what? The problem? No, the problem. We know what the problem is. We need to focus on God's answer to the problem. Really, here's how he said it. We need to focus on his promises, not the problem. And so that's my encouragement this morning, that it's really based on how do we look at Scripture. You see, in Proverbs 23, verse 7, it says this, and I'm going to add a little word here. I'm not adding a Scripture, but I'm going to put a he, she, and say just a he. For as he or she thinks of himself, so they are. So right now, however you see yourself, however you think about yourself, so you are. Do you see yourself as an undercomer or an overcomer? Do you see someone who's at the back or at the front? Do you see somebody, yourself as the tail and not the head? It really depends on how you see yourself today. And so most of us, and, and, and I, you know, I hate to say this to you, but I've seen some of these posts and some Christians and the things they put on the Internet, and I want to go, I can tell you right now who you believe and who you put your trust based on what you're saying. You know, as I said to you last Sunday, the world's looking for us to separate ourselves from it. I can say this to you. They don't have the answer. Christ does. And so for you and I, it's found in his word. So how do you see yourself? It's the very key to whether or not you'll have peace or joy through this crazy situation we find ourselves. 
Turn to first, uh, 2 Corinthians with me, chapter 10. And let me encourage you with this before I get to Philippians. I want to give you the, these verses, this verse, and there, I'm going to start in verse 1, and I'm going to go all the way down to verse 5. Now this again is Paul talking to the Christians in Corinth. And he says, now I, Paul, myself urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I am who would meet with, uh, when face to face with you, excuse me, meet when face to face with you, but bold toward you in my absence. I ask that when I am present, I might not be bold with confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walk, watch this, as if we walk according to the flesh. For if you and I walk according to the flesh, we do not war according to this flesh. For the weapons of mind and your warfare are not flesh, but are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. You see, we are destroying speculation of every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge or the truth found in here of God. And you and I are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Here's what it says. Before I speak it, let me run it through God's word to see if it lines up. Before I say something that might, you know, because the Bible says your words give life or they give death. Before I speak something into existence, have I filtered it through, does it line up with God's word? In the midst of this anxiety and worry and doubt and fear, I got you. But what I'm trying to get us to understand is my reaction to this epidemic, this pandemic, is not the fact that it's here. It is here. The, the real thing is, how am I going to react to it? Am I just going to be the same status quo as everybody else? Or have I filtered my thoughts? You know, have I taken every thought captive to the obedience of Christ? Because your words could be the very words that could change another human being's life. Maybe a co-worker. Maybe a neighbor. Maybe a family member. Who's really struggling? I mean, you know, folks, I'll tell you, and I hate to say this over the internet, but, you know, this is a time where suicide rates begin to rise because of desperation and despair and fear. You see, our adversary, the, uh, the devil, the Bible says, runs around looking for those whom he can devour. He's trying to find the weakest of the weak. And he's trying to bombard them and, and see and, and, and propel himself into their life and their weakness. And then all of a sudden they, they see no hope and they see no future. Maybe your words are the one words that can change the direction or the destiny of their life. But yet, if we build ourselves into the same narrative, that's a good political word, narrative of this, of this current situation, then we're just going downstream with everybody else. I think God tells us to go upstream when everybody else is going downstream. Stand up and be heard. Be bold and courageous, he told Joshua. You know, Joshua's in the midst of fear. And God looked at him and said, be bold. Wait a minute, God. That's not what I really wanted to hear. No, I need you to be bold and courageous. For the Lord your God goes before you. Can you imagine Moses, how much fear and anxiety was in his heart? I need you to go stand in front of the most powerful man on the planet. His name's Pharaoh. And I need you to tell him this. Uh, can I tell him something else? Maybe let me tell him his hair looks good. Let me tell him he looks good in all that beautiful dress and all that gold wrapped around his neck. But no, please don't tell me to tell him what you want me to say to him. Because I don't know that I'll make it out of there alive. Can you can you imagine how much fear he had for God told him to be bold? And you know what he said to him? He said, I'll be with you. Even to the point he said, I'll speak my very words through you. Maybe your coworker, maybe your family member, maybe your friend, maybe needs to hear the very words of God that you put in your heart that week. Because I say this in discipleship all the time. We don't memorize scripture around here just because we go, oh, look, we're good. I've memorized scripture. We use it so that at the time when we need it, those words come out of our mouth because the Bible says when he speaks it, it brings life. And it will not return to him void. So here's the deal. We need to change the way we think. We need to change our thoughts. We need to change our understanding. See, all these things start very simply for us with the truth of God's word. And I'm going to speak these truths to you very simply through the scripture. You see, I need to gain control. I wrote this little note to Robbie. You know, I, I did over my margin. I said, Robbie, because, you know, I'm one of those that needs some help. I'm glad nobody said amen. 
You see, I said, Robbie, gain control over your thought life because your attitude is at the very beginning of how you're thinking. My attitude is at the very beginning of what I'm thinking. So I need to change how I think. You see, in these scriptures I'm going to read you this morning, joy and peace are directly linked, and I use that word directly, directly linked to how you and I think. So our thought life should be guarded in the truth of scripture. You say, well, is that biblical? I'm fixing to give you a, a verse. You see, learning how to think biblically, now this is huge, instead of naturally. Learning how to think biblically instead of naturally. What does God say? What's God's perspective? Well, if you got your Bibles, go to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. And look at it with me real quick. Now, here's Jesus, you know, who, who uh, if I'm going to listen to somebody, I think I'm going to listen to him. He said these, and he was saying, that which proceeds out of a man... That which, is, that which defiles that man comes from within. Out of the heart of that man proceeds the, proceeds the evil thoughts of fornication, thefts, murderous adulteries, deeds, covenant, wickedness, and all kinds of deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. You see, Jesus said all these evil things proceed from within and defile that man. You hear me say this a lot. Dirty thinking leads to stinky lives. You also hear me say, if I want to change the way somebody behaves, I first have to change what they believe. Now think about that for a second. If we want to change how we behave, if I want to change the behavior, I first have to change how I, what I believe. So here, here's my analogy, real simple. If, if I believe that stealing is wrong, and I, and I believe that in my mind, then I won't steal. I've changed my behavior. If I believe that lying is wrong, and, and, and I know I'm convinced in my mind that I'm not supposed to lie, then what, guess what? My behavior, I won't lie. But now here's the, here's the deal. But let's just say that we buy into the narrative that, well, I, you know, it wasn't total truth, but I really didn't lie. It was somewhere in the middle. And, and, and we kind of somehow figure, oh, you know what? I don't know whose that was. You know, I know that girl gave me twenty dollars too much from the cash register. That's just her fault. She made a mistake. You know what? That's to my benefit, and she'll be all right. What you don't know is when they count up the money at the end of the day, and she goes to her boss and her registers twenty dollars short, and the boss says you're fired because you stole. She didn't steal. She made a mistake. However, I benefited from the twenty dollars, but she lost her job. What I didn't know, she was a single mom with three kids and going home to tell her kids, I just lost my job. However, if I've changed how, what I thought, and then I changed the behavior, my behavior says, when I got to the parking lot, I turned back around, went in and said, sweetheart, you gave me $20 too much money. Now, do you think that changed her destiny? Because of a, some thought I had? No. It changed how I behaved. And I did what was right. We're going to get to that word here in just a minute. So do you see that? So how we handle things how we handle this pandemic might even change the destiny of another human being. Do you think that you and I have that kind of power? No, but that power rests in us through Christ Jesus. Wow. So Jesus made these statements that what's in me will defile me. So what do I got to change? What's on the outside? Do I need to look better? Do I need to comb my hair? Oh, I don't have hair. Do I need to <laughs> I need to put curves in. I mean, whatever I need to do to, to change. No, we're too busy trying to change this rather than changing what's on the inside. So when we look at this passage, and flip, flip over with me real quick, back to Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to read this whole passage to you, and then I'm going to come back and take it apart. Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 4. I love the very first word. Rejoice in the Lord always. Now, it didn't say rejoice in the Lord when everything's great. When everything is controllable by you. Now, for those of you who have A personalities in the room, I'm going to put both my hands up. Since there's only three of us in the room, I 
Oh, April, I'm a double A, I guess. Okay, there's another double A back in the back. Thank you for participating. Thank you for playing. Um, this is a heart that rejoices always. See, because we love to control things. Amen or amen? I mean, we do. And, and so when it's out of our control, we kind of get a little weird. We get wiggy. Y'all you know what wiggy is? That's one of Joel's little ver words. You know? When, 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 when we can't control, we get a little antsy. Things kind of get a little sideways on us because it's out of our control. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Now watch this. He even repeats himself and says, and again I say, rejoice. Wow. You mean in the midst of this that we're going through, I'm to rejoice? Amen. And, and, and Nancy and I had this talk. I said, let me say this to you so that if you come back to me and make sure I'm okay with this. I said, it could be worse. And you know what it could be? You know, folks, I, as I study history and I look back at all the things that have bro broken out of throughout chronicles of history, I mean, this is not as bad as some of the epidemics that have broke out when we didn't have medicine, when we didn't have ways to treat things. I mean, I, I'm serious. The swine flu, if you, if you just want to do a little history, I mean, things have gotten really bad where hundreds of thousands of people died. Now, if you really want to step back in history, let's go back to the plagues back in Egypt. I mean, I'm talking about people dropping dead in droves. So I want to say to you, it could be worse. Now, I want to be real connect with you. I understand that it's serious. No, I'm not making light of that. But I want you to look at it and think on these things. It could be worse. And watch what he says. Let your forbearing spirit be known to all men. See, the deal is, you see that known to all men? What's happening in you, what's happening in me, will be known by the people around you. It's key in how you and I as a Christian react to this craziness in our current world. I mean, it's nuts. I hear stuff every day in the business sector. I mean, you would have think, I mean, <laughs> hey, I understand 401ks. <laughs> I don't even look anymore. It is depressing. But guess what? My hope is not in what's in that little bitty line that's going down. My hope is in who's already been at the top. Amen. If I look at that line, I'm going to go, oh, woe is me. Despair and agony. Or I trust him. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. I trust him and I'm not trusting in anybody else. So when he says these words, the way that I'm reacting so that it can be known to all men that the Lord, here's the cool part, that the Lord's near. <laughs> he didn't leave us. He hadn't gone back and sit on his lofty throne and said, okay, when this is over, I'll, I'll come within 10 feet of you. You know, when it's all over, I'll come down and help you out a little bit. The Bible says that the Lord is near. Now watch this. And be anxious for nothing. Uh-oh. But you don't understand my situation, God. Yes, he does. Remember last week when we talked about Jesus had been tempted in all ways just like in a, 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 unto us? He understands. He said, I'm not a God who's so lofty. I can't understand your feelings. Remember that verse we shared last Sunday? God knows how you feel. God knows what you're going through. But in everything, in prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Tell him how you feel. Tell him what you're struggling with. Ask him to send the assistance you need on the inner man to help you turn your anxieties and anxiousness into joy and into peace. Let him comfort you because he said, I'll comfort you with all comfort, the Bible says. Let him, but you have to ask him. And for those men who are walk, you know, watching my, my TV, I got you, dude. I mean, you know, I know you want to be Hercules and Superman and Batman all wrapped into one. It's all right if you tell God, man, I'm struggling. I'm, I'm really struggling. I, I, I don't know if I can do this or take care of. Tell him. And don't think you've got to be this man who, I'm just telling you, that pride will come before the fall. Believe me. My trust and my hope is in him. So watch what he says in verse 7. After we've done those things, and the peace of God, which surpasses all our comprehension, shall guard your heart and your minds 
in Christ Jesus. Whoa. God's near. He's not far. Don't be anxious, but ask me. Now watch what he says. And then the peace of God, which you can't even understand yet. It says it surpasses. It goes way beyond what you could ever hope, imagine, or think. To guard your heart. And that guard your heart comes from a passage in Proverbs 4.23 where he said, the, the writer of Proverbs says, guard your heart with all diligence for out of your heart flows all the issues of your life. So friend, here's what I'm here to tell you today and encourage you. Guard your heart. You know, we as Christians believe our heart and our mind are one and the same. That when God makes reference to the heart. So what he's saying, listen, guard your heart. Don't let certain things in. Make sure that you put that layer of protection of my, the truth of my word around your heart because Satan's going to attack your heart. He's going to attack you at the most vulnerable place that you are. So guard your heart. Why? So that all men can see you reacting differently than the rest of this crazy world. Can you imagine Job and his story? Lost everything he had. Can you imagine all the people in his community? Man, he lost his camels. He lost all his sheep, lost all his goat. Oh, man, he lost all his children. Oh, there goes his house. Lost all his land. Can you imagine? And, you know, and Job, you know, his reaction to the situation. Now, look at his physical body, man. He's decaying in front of our eyes. He's got so many boils over his body. The Bible says he couldn't lay down or sit up where he was in pain. Can you imagine the community around him going, man, God must be mad at him. But see, Job even told his own wife, he says, honey, he didn't say it this way. That's why I'd say to Nancy, honey, sweetie, sugar, if you can't take God in the good, how can you take him in the bad? Wow. What kind of faith is that? He was renewing the inner man. He knew. And here's, if you haven't read the book of Job, just maybe this week, go to the end of the book, and it says, and God restored everything in his life, and he got more than he ever started with. He gave his kids back, the new kids. All of his land, all of his ox, all of his sheep, all of his wealth was given back to him, not based on who Job was, but based on what God had done in Job. There's hope in the midst of hopelessness. Giddy up. So let me hit these real quick with you. Again, I want to make sure I don't lose some of you. I know it's coffee break for a few. Some of you have had to go to the bathroom already. I got that. So... Uh, but let me hit these, and, and I want you to write these down with me real quick. The next thing says finally. That word finally, as he's saying here, is kind of summing up what he just said in those verses I just read to you. He says, whatever is true. Now, if you're writing that down, whatever is true, in John 3, 33, it says God is true. In Titus 1, verse 2, it says, and God, listen, cannot even lie. So God's true. Whatever is true, John 7, 18, it says Jesus is true and he is, and his unrighteousness is ever before him. You see, on the other hand, there's somebody else who's not true. And, it, and if you don't know that, I'm going to read you a verse that will hopefully convince you that there is someone who doesn't tell you the truth. And Jesus addressed him in John chapter 8, verse 44. He says, for you are the father of the devil and you and you want to uh, want to do the desires of your father. He said, it's his very nature. He speaks from his nature, for he is the liar, and he is the father of lies. I love what it says right before this. There is no truth in him. Whatever he speaks is a lie. So see, the Bible says, whatever is true, we've got to quit thinking and listening to the wrong voices. And concentrate on what's true. His word is true. It says whatever is honorable. That word honorable means to be dignified or noble or high respect. You see, how we act to God's truth shows us how we hold God in highest regard. Do I really believe him or not? Think on these things. That's what he's telling you. All right, whatever's on. Let me think about how good he is. Let me think about all the great things he's done. Think on those things. Just for a moment when those negative um, thoughts are running at you and the information is bombarding you, he says, stop for a moment and think, whatever's honorable. Let me, let me re remember what he's, what he's done in my life already. Wow. 
He says the next one, whatever's right. The word right there is the word righteous. You know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 26, it says God is righteous. And that word is a, is a big word. In Acts 3, 14, it also said that Jesus was righteous. And the word righteous means to live in harmony with the truths of God's word, to live right with God. I'm going to give that to you again. It means to live in harmony with the truths of God's word or the standards which are unchanging about his truths. God, listen to this real quick. God's truths do not change based on our circumstance. But guess what? His truth will change our circumstance. If we'll use those truths against our circumstances. If we'll speak those things into existence that do not exist, Paul said. Those things which are not, if we say that are, we can bring life to things that are dead. We can say things that will bring life in the midst because we speak life of the truth of God's word. So that's what it means to be right. Whatever is pure. That word is the word undefiled or holy. In 1 John, of course, you know, we all read this passage, be holy because I'm holy. He says that in Peter as well. God's calling us to live a life and, and, and don't go backwards but go forwards. Don't slip back to living in an old way of life but continue living the life that I called you to. Don't allow your circumstance to change how you decide to live. Whatever's lovely. I love this one. It's sweet, gracious, and patient. Now, those are three great qualities I have. <laughs> amen. I know I said amen to that. I didn't get one of those. But, you know, those qualities I don't have. I don't wake up in the morning and go, oh, my God, I just feel so sweet. I feel so gracious. I don't. I've got to work on whatever's lovely. And, and patience. You know, that's a, the Greek word for the word patience is the word hoopa uh, I learned that about 20 something years ago in our marriage when. I learned that in, in seminary, and uh, I told Nancy the word was hoopamony. So from then on, I, I used to hear that from her all the time. Oh, hoopamony. When I get anxious and you know with the kids, and y'all know I had five teenagers at one time, and there were times I literally, you know, y'all know what I mean. And oh, patience. And see, that comes from Nancy naturally. It just doesn't come from me. So whatever's of good repute is the next one. And you know what that word good repute? well thought of. So here's the question I've got. So if we're going to think on these things, how are people well thought of? How are people thinking about me and you and how we're handling the pandemic, which came from the epidemic? Now we turned it into a panic. As I said to you last week, if you're a Christian today, I'm fixing to get in trouble. Nancy, I'm basically getting thrown anyway. If you bought, you know, 72,000 rolls of toilet paper, you're living in panic. If you bought up everything in that store that had to do you, every king didn't get to think about anybody, you're living in a pandemic. And I'm fixing to share some verses with you for us as Christians. Now, hey, we also got to think right. I, don't get me wrong. I mean, I need to make sure I have gas in the car to get to work and all those things. I, I, I don't mean that. But there's no word called hoarding in the scriptures. There's a lot of words called giving. Giving. So let me throw something at you this week. So how do we put this into practice? Go next door, knock on your neighbor's door and go, hey man, uh, you got enough toilet paper? Hey sister, you got enough canned goods? Is there anything you need? I'll tell you what happened to me this week. Nancy and I happened to be up there. We we, uh, we have uh, musky dines and scuffle dines and I'm a blackberry freak, and we planted blackberry bushes, and we were working there, you know, again, trying to get out of the house, and we were putting up new wires to do all that, and it's up near the street of our house, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, we get a couple cars riding by, and go, ready to pack? I said, no, not yet, but we're getting them. Another guy pulled up and said, hey, how are you? I said, fine. He said, uh, well, it looks like you're working hard. I said, yeah. And he, he said something interesting. He said, you got enough toilet paper? I've never met this man before. You got enough? And it hit me, and I went, from a stranger. Yeah, man, I appreciate it, but I got enough. Nancy's full of it, but I'm not. I'm not it. I mean, it, I, we got it. But it really hit me that this guy pulled off to the side of the road and asked me that question. So what about that single mom in your area of influence who's trying to raise kids by herself? I know we're not supposed to be socializing. I got all that. You got to use some smarts. But you know what? That ain't going to keep you from going alone on somebody. Hey, let me throw one at you real quick. Can I pay your power bill for you? 
Can I, can I pay your mortgage for you? Whatever is honorable, well thought of. Can I, can I help you in some way that you can't help yourself? Because God has blessed me so much, I want to become a blessing. Wow. Proverbs 4.23 says it this way. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of your life. There's a guy named Frank Outlaw. Outlaw that's a cool word. Frank Outlaw. He wrote this, and uh, I don't know if he was a Christian or not, but it uh, sounds like he is. And I'm going to give it to you. He says, watch your thoughts. They'll become your words. Then he said, watch your words. They'll become your actions. Then he said, watch your actions because they'll become your habits. He said, watch your habits. They'll become your character. He said, watch your character. They will become your destiny. Wow. How true. I'm going to give you five things to do. Here they are real quick. First and foremost, while we're all at home, we need to have the mind of Christ. We need to start thinking right. Maybe you heard me use the word paradigm. We need to look at this the way God sees it, not the way we see it. Get his vantage point, not mine. We need the mind of Christ. There's only one place you can get it, which brings me to number two. First and foremost, I need you to block. Hey, you know, I learned this. This book. You know you can block people on Facebook? Did you know that? I didn't know that because I'm not really versed on that stuff. I don't know if that's like they get this message. Oh, you've been blocked, right? You know, if you watch TV very much, there's that show, uh, what, what is it? The Voice, I think is what it's called. Yeah, and uh, I like to watch it because I think that guy, Blake Shelton's crazy. But they can block another judge from getting a contestant. You know, it, it comes out in big, bold letters, block. I don't know if you're Facebook. I haven't blocked anybody this week, but if you don't behave, I might start blocking somebody. But not for you. But you know what? You block away. Here we go. The sources of bad information that's changing the way you think. Block it. Quit looking at those things that you continue to look at. Quit going to the places that aren't bringing you encouragement. Watch this. Quit listening to the voices that are not lifting you up. Number three, you need a day. That's how you put on the mind of Christ. Transform my mind by the renewing of your word. So, friend, if, if you're not spending time in God's word this week, turn the TV off, get rid of the chatter, get rid of the noise, and allow God to speak truth to you and to me and, and settle my spirit and my anxiousness through his word. Now, here's a cool one. Here's the fourth one. Expose your mind to new forms of information. I'll give you encouragement. I told Nancy this one. You know, go on the internet and Google champions of the faith or, you know, people who've done crazy things in life and people like uh, Oswald Chambers, A.W. Tozer, Jim Elliott, a missionary in Africa, uh, South America, Corey Tim Boom. Read articles and things that they wrote that changed their life. Mother Teresa. Change the what just don't go to the same place to get the same information. Expand your mind to hear the voices of other people who've done some stuff that were just normal, everyday people like me and you. And all of a sudden you go, wow, you mean God used somebody? Yeah, you need to hear those things. Here's the fifth one. And then expose your mind by putting your faith into action. And I've already covered that with you, things that you can do. So here, I end you with some, some verses, and uh, hope you'll be encouraged by them. Um, first and foremost, Philippians 4.19 says, And my God shall supply all, not some, all of our needs according to his riches and glory. In Christ Jesus. Now here's the cool part. All his riches, not yours. Read that verse. And God shall supply all your needs according to his unbelievably deep resources of heaven, his riches into our lives. Psalm 84 11 says, 
There is no good thing he does not withhold from any of us who walk uprightly. There's nothing he'll hold back from us. Psalm 84, 11. And then I end it with reading you probably, you know, again, I got to go to the big guy. Jesus himself. I'm going to listen to somebody. I'm going to listen to him right next to Nancy. But in Matthew chapter 6, right after the Beatitudes, he said these things. And I encourage you with these words. And why are you anxious about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you, even Solomon in all the glory, his glory, did not clothe himself like one of those. But if God so arrays the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more do for you and I? O oh, men and women of little faith, do not be anxious then saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we clothe ourselves? For Watch this. For all these things, the Gentiles or those other people are eagerly seeking. And that's his comparison. The world's going crazy. They don't know where their source is. They don't know where it's coming from. Many of them who've lost their jobs are relying on themselves. And I encourage you, if you hear my voice, it's his voice saying to you, that's how they think. But watch this. Eagerly seek, for as your heavenly Father knows what Robbie Bailey needs and all the things that he needs, but he says to Robbie, seek me and my kingdom first, Robbie, and my righteousness, and all those things, Robbie, will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious for tomorrow, Robbie, for tomorrow has will care for itself, for each day Robbie has enough trouble of its own. Amen? So see, that's the deal. God's telling us to think differently. And he gave us those words, you know, think on these things. And friend, you need to read that every day this week. Think on this, think on this, think on this, think on this. When the midst of all this craziness, think on this. And uh, I encourage you to do so. And, uh, you know, Katie and the team did such a great job this morning. And I wish you could have been here. I love, I love to worship with y'all, but, you know, I'm one of those kind of guys that worships in his own little world. My kids used to give me a hard time because I'd be singing the second verse when I should be singing the first. I just get lost in worship. And it doesn't bother me. It bothers me. And they used to say, ooh, Dad, can't you sing the right words? It doesn't matter. He just wants to hear me. So I'm going to ask Katie and the team to come back. We're going to sing that song that they did here at the end. And, uh, and then I'll come back and end it with you and bless you and send you out of here. But uh, where are you sitting? We're just going to sing this because it fits what we're talking about today. Uh, and it won't take just, we're just going to sing a couple of the, ver the course, uh, a couple of the verses in the, the course. And, uh, but I want to leave you with you thinking this way. And uh, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of a sound mind. Perfect love casts out all fear. And as we sing this, I just want you to kind of close your Bible, maybe close your eyes. And make this your prayer to him, that you would sing this song to him, and, uh, and then I'll bless you and send you out for the rest of the day.